<clears throat> okay here. All right, all right then. Yeah. So um uh let's carry on. Are you ready for more? Yeah, okay, wonderful. That's great because otherwise uh that's great. And uh, just to uh, remind you, we're looking at the sutta called the uh, Anicca Sanya Sutta, the uh, this Buddha's discourse on the perception of impermanence. Uh, this is what the sutta is about. Uh, and uh, we're looking at kind of the uh, introductory paragraph, uh, what the perception of impermanence can do for us. Uh, and what we have seen so far is kind of very, it's very profound. Yeah, It's the First of all, it eliminates all desires for in the five sense realm. Then it also eliminates desires in the realm of the, uh, the jhanas, luminous form. And uh, Wai Yin pointed out yesterday that it was not in Bikibodhi's translation, which is kind of a bit concerning. You wonder what's going on. <laughs> so sometimes the Pali is not stable also. There can be slight differences in, in the Pali. But that's, uh, I don't think it is any major problem because I think regardless, we are on the right track here. Yeah. And then it also eliminates all desire for rebirth, all rebirth in the future. Yeah, so uh, all rebirth is seen as problematic when you understand uh, the idea of impermanence or unreliability. Uh, you have no idea where you're going to go next, uh, what's going to happen, uh, what sort of come are you going to make, etc., etc. And then we come to the very last benefit of uh, uh, this perception of impermanence uh, coming at the very end here. Uh, and that is that it eliminates all ignorance and eradicates all conceit, I am. Yeah, so this is like the very end of the path. Uh, the ignorance here, of course, being avidja, better translated as delusion or illusion or uh, lack of understanding or wrong view, or, or all of these kind of things, uh, especially delusion. And uh, this, of course, takes you to the very end of the path. You become an arahant, uh, and you eradicate the conceit, I am. Uh, the very feeling, I am, or the very perception, I am, is completely gone. Uh, and uh, that's kind of a very different reality from what we are used to. Uh, and this is where it takes you, because I am relies on the sense of uh, permanence, that you are somebody, that there is some inherent essence, which is the real you. That's what this feeling relies on. Uh, and once you see that everything is impermanent, actually that uh, conceit, that pride, that uh, perception that you exist in a certain way, it cannot really survive after that. Uh, and uh, that may seem to many people to be a terrible thing if I am disappears. Uh, but of course, from a Buddhist point of view, it is a lot of happiness Yeah, when I am is gone. I am is a problem. Uh, I am is suffering. Uh, I am causes all kinds of uh, issues. It causes pride. It causes us to fight. It causes us to compare ourselves to others. Uh, it causes uh, a lot of problems in the world. Uh, and actually, it often detracts from your ability to be happy because uh, the, the I am sort of... Uh, um, Instead of wanting to be happy, it wants to exist. Uh, and that existence all, often gets in the way of happiness. Uh. So, yeah, perception of impermanence, uh, very, very powerful. Uh, it does all of these things. Basically, it does everything you want it to do on the Buddhist path. Uh, so it's very useful. Uh. But uh, let, let's go back a little bit to the beginning again uh, yeah, of these various uh, benefits of impermanence. Uh. And uh, the first one that we saw is the idea that it eliminates all desires for, um, for pleasure in the five senses. Yeah? It, all, everything to do with the five senses, all desire regarding the five senses uh, is eliminated. Uh. And this is the most important thing. Uh. This is the basic thing uh, of the idea of, of contemplating impermanence. Uh. The other things are very, very profound. And if I were you, I wouldn't be too concerned about those, uh, at least not until your meditation is really strong. Yeah? When the med meditation is really strong, uh, your samadhi is coming together, then you can worry about these other things. Uh. But in the meantime, this is the one that matters. Uh. The other ones are not so important. Uh. So focus on this. Uh. And uh, remember the way to do this. And I'm going to um, one way of, of thinking about this, one way, a very common way that impermanence is, is uh, taught in Buddhist circles, uh, 
Uh, and if you go to a, a so-called vipassana retreat, uh, yeah, what they will tell you, they will tell you to contemplate impermanence. Yeah, the arising of phenomena. They say feelings coming, sensations coming, sensations passing away. It's a typical. If you go to Guenka retreat, this is kind of how they will teach you these things. Uh, uh, but this is uh, this is a particular way of contemplating impermanence. Uh, and that way of contemplating impermanence really is really well suited after your meditation is very profound. The more profound your meditation is, the better will be your ability to see things rising and passing away in your mind in this way. Because the mind will be strong. The mind will be, have the ability to withstand any fear that may arise as a consequence. The mind is very stable. It can stay with the object very easily. So that sort of... What they call vipassana, I don't really know if it's a good name for that sort of meditation, but anyway, that's what they call it. Uh, that sort of vipassana meditation is really kind of fairly advanced. Uh, yeah? Already, you have kind of, ideally, you have kind of gone a long way in the practice. Uh, and, uh, but there is more preliminary development of the idea of impermanence. Uh, and that, to me, is far more powerful in the early stages of one's mental development. And this is this general sense of impermanence in the world. Uh, and you will see later on, when we come to the various perceptions that the Buddha is talking about, uh, he talks about a very general development of impermanence in the world outside of us. Uh, not just looking at the mind as such, uh, yeah, which is, comes to my mind much later on, uh, but actually there's a general feeling of how the world is so utterly unstable, huh? because that takes you away the interest from the world outside, and taking the interest away from the world outside is a preliminary for meditation to function. You have to come within yeah, to be able to, um, uh, to be able to actually observe internal phenomena. And so we need to kind of do things in the right sequence. Uh, and I think that sometimes going straight to the vipassana, it actually is going too fast. Uh, we haven't really established enough calm yet of the mind, enough samadhi, enough of these powerful qualities that actually enables vipassana or panya to become really powerful. Uh, and the way to get to the, to the samadhi, the way to get to that peace of mind, is through this sort of preliminary understanding of impermanence. Uh, and so we should focus on this. Uh, yeah, And this kind of idea of impermanence is actually is not very difficult to contemplate because it is around us at all times. And very often we just don't understand how powerful this kind of impermanence actually is. And the more we understand the power of this impermanence, and however present it is, developing that perception, the more we actually have the ability to become peaceful in meditation. So develop this. Yeah, Remember what it really is about. Remember that the, the, everything around us is changing. Nothing in the world is stable. And when we talk about the world, I mean everything in the world of the five senses, from the largest scale to the smallest scale, to ideas, to, uh, you know, to everything really. And uh, then you start to kind of withdraw more to the internal refuge that we have inside instead. And uh, the, way, the way, one way of thinking about this, I was saying the other day, slightly tongue-in-cheek, I was saying, expect the unexpected. Yeah? So is that possible to expect the unexpected? Huh? <laughs> but the, the point is that you are open to that things will change. That's kind of the idea, right? So you expect kind of weird things to happen. That's kind of the idea. And the reason why we should expect the unexpected is that impermanence is the idea of unreliability is always happening out of sight. We cannot see the cause and conditions are being put into place right now as we are sitting here. And then one day the cause and conditions come together to the point where they issue in some major change in our society. So, for example, the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine kind of came as a surprise for everyone. Yeah? Or maybe not everyone, there were some indications. But in general, it came as a surprise. I think a lot of people in Europe in particular, they said, we are finished with the war. We never want to have war again. For good reason. War is not a very pleasant thing. Yeah? And uh, so why does it happen? The reason why it happens is because there are all these causes and conditions happening out of sight. We can't see them. It's building up out of sight. And then eventually, when it comes to a certain, these causes reach a certain momentum, uh, then the impermanence becomes visible to everyone here. Uh, and the idea is, it's a bit like uh, uh, this idea of, uh, I mentioned this before, but I will mention it again, uh, the idea of the tectonic plates. Uh, 
Yeah, when we have the tectonic plates moving in the world uh, and the kind of the pressures build up, the build up, the build up. Uh, and eventually the pressure becomes so high that the kind of uh, the earthquake arises. Uh, yeah, and then bang, the earthquake comes. Uh, and then impermanence is very visible. Uh, and the world is like this. Things are always happening out of sight, uh, cause and conditions building up uh, until eventually something happens uh, and we don't expect it. Uh, and the reason we don't expect it, we cannot see what actually is going on uh, out of, uh, you know, in the world uh, uh, beyond our ability to perceive or whatever. Uh, so this is why this is so problematic. Uh, and uh, so impermanence is always there. Uh, it is all, things are always moving. Uh, yeah, things are always shaking. It's like, you know, one of the kind of other images that I sometimes like to use is the idea that we're kind of, because everything is always moving, it means like there's a low level kind of earthquake going on at all times, yeah? You're kind of trying to find the stand on the ground. Where can I stand, yeah? And wherever you stand, it's like this moving a little bit. You can't really get a firm foothold anywhere, right? And then after a while, the forces build up. And then that low-level earthquake, the low-level shaking, suddenly becomes a big shaking. And then as you're trying to stand, you fall over. There's nowhere in the world you can take a stand. There's nowhere in the world you can really hold on to Whenever you try to hold on to something, uh, yeah, the forces of impermanence are going to come and they're going to rip it from your grip. Uh, and then you're going to suffer it because you're trying to hold on to that which is not hold honorable. <laughs> this is a, this is a uh, new term, hold honorable, un unhold honorability. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, the, the Buddhist, one of the translations we should maybe uh, apply to the sutta just to make them really hard to understand. Uh, and so this is the idea yeah, about the understanding the idea of impermanence. Uh, and that gradually reduces your grip on the world. Uh, yeah? You start to see things in a new way. Uh, so it is very, actually very powerful. So and all you have to do sometimes is uh, just keep your ears and eyes open. Uh, yeah? See the news on TV. You can see the impermanence right away. Uh, see the news right here in, uh, in KL, yeah, in Malaysia. Uh, see the things happening in your family, someone getting sick. Uh, you know, the house getting cracks, you know, your car getting broken into. I don't know what happens here in Malaysia, whatever. You know, hey, these things happen everywhere. So it probably happens here as well. Uh, and uh, that is actually impermanence. Uh, and right there is an opportunity to learn. Uh, an opportunity. Wait a minute. I'm reacting to this in a bad way. Why am I reacting to this? Uh, didn't the Buddha say impermanence? Uh, shouldn't I expect this to happen? Uh, and suddenly, instead of reacting badly, negativity, getting upset when these things happen, okay, you get a little bit upset, that's okay. It's to be expected. You would be superhuman if it didn't upset you a little bit, right? So yes, it upsets you a little bit. But then you think, wait a minute, what can I learn from this? And the moment you think like that, actually, the world seems less interesting. Because a world which has these qualities that you cannot control, that is always shaking, always waiting for the earthquake to come, that world just is not interesting anymore. Huh? Yeah, we lose that uh, desire to grip and to hold on to those things that are ultimately out of control. Huh? And so that is what you learn there. Huh? And then you will see, every time you see these things, uh, you are developing the perception of impermanence. Uh, every time you see that, your grip loosens a little bit. Uh, every time you see those things, your mind turns more towards the real safety in the world, which is, of course, the triple gem. Uh, the inner happiness, the understanding of what the world is like. Yeah. Your mind moves in the right direction. Yeah. And this is the whole point of having a spiritual path, is that you have a, some hold somewhere, some stability, yeah. because the laws of the Dhamma, the laws of the mind, well, these are things that are, in, you know, they are reliable in a sense. Yeah. And that is what you can hold on to. Yeah. So the beauty of letting go of the world is that the mind moves on to the spiritual practice instead. Yeah. That is the power of this. Yeah? This is actually very beautiful. Now you can find some real security. Yeah? So use, think of impermanence in this way. Yeah? Don't think it so much about observing impermanence in your meditation. Yeah? Because I have seen people trying to go on Vipassana retreats, observing impermanence, uh, but they haven't got enough samadhi. They haven't got enough peace of mind for that really to be powerful. And very often it doesn't actually take you very far. Yeah? But if you observe impermanence just around you, and this is something you can do in daily life, you can do it at all times, uh, over time that will change your view of the world uh, and you are developing that perception far more powerfully. Uh. So uh, now, having set out 
the various ways in which the power, the perception of impermanence, uh, uh, the ways that it uh, uh, affects your life, first of all, by eliminating desire for sensual pleasure, and uh, then uh, eliminating desire for rebirth in the realm of luminous form. This is far more advanced. Yeah, This is a long way down the track, but it's here for just for uh, pointing it out. Uh, uh, eliminating desire for rebirth in, in the future life, uh, and then finally eliminating all delusion and eradicating all con sorry, excuse me, all conceit I am. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the very end of the path. That's when you become an arahant. Uh, so that's kind of uh, for most people. That's uh, I shouldn't say it's in the future because nothing is really in the future. But it uh, takes a bit of cause and conditions to fall into place. That's what I'm trying to say, I suppose. Uh, so wait for those cause and conditions. Don't try to create them and make them happen too fast. And now the Buddha comes up with these beautiful similes to show the power of the perception of impermanence. So have, let's have a look at all of these similes, just very briefly, uh, see what he has to say. In the autumn, a farmer plowing with a large plow shears through all root networks, in the same way, when the perception of impermanence is it developed, it eradicates all conceit, I am. Yeah, it eradicates all of those things, uh, culminating in the conceit, I am. This is <clears throat> really nice. The, even though I didn't drink the coffee in the beginning, it's still hot because the uh, my super-duper attendant who is looking after me, he heated it up for me just before this. Isn't that nice? It's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. People are really kind of uh, very uh, service providing. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so this has the idea that uh, you are plowing, shearing through all the root networks. Yeah, And of course, if you want to eliminate something from growing again in the future, uh, and when we talk about growing here, what are we talking about? We're talking about dukkha. We're talking about the growing of suffering. Yeah? And if you don't want suffering to grow in the future, yeah, often when we talk about growth, we think about growth of the five khandas or the growth of rebirth uh, or the growth of defilements. But ultimately, it comes back to the growth of suffering. Yeah? It's suffering that we want to avoid. Uh, and so if you want suffering to stop growing, you have to cut off the roots. Yeah? What are the roots that feed that suffering? Yeah? And uh, those roots, of course, are, uh, you know, are basically everything, you know, the conceit I am is the ultimate root, if you like, uh, ignorance or, uh, not, I don't, I, I keep saying I don't like the word ignorance and then I'm using it myself. That's usually what happens. Uh, uh, delusion, yeah, uh, misunderstandings. Uh, so you cut through all the roots, uh, just like the plow shearing through the root networks uh, when the farmer is plowing uh, in, the, uh, in the autumn. Uh, in the autumn, is that when you plow the fields? I guess it is. Okay, I don't know anything about this anyway. So I guess that's when you plow. I mm. thought maybe you would plow before you sow in the early spring, but maybe that's completely misunderstanding. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna, I must have had very bad education. I don't even know these basic things. That's just kind of worrying, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> oh dear. No. It's gonna live in different seasons, yeah. Ah, okay. Thank you, Niwar. That's really that's, that's good that you are. <laughs> that's, that's maybe maybe there's some truth to that actually, because you had to wait for the snow to melt before you can plow the field, probably, right? So yeah, thank you for helping me out on that one. That makes me feel much better. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, not number one, uh, simile, right? It shows the power of the idea of impermanence. It takes, it cuts, it destroys all the roots of suffering. Everything gets cut off. So that suffering cannot grow again in the future. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh. Next one, a reed cutter having cut the reeds, grab them at the top and shakes them down, shakes them about and shakes them off. In the same way, when a perception of impermanence is developed, it eradicates all conceit I am. So I don't not really understand this one. Does anyone else understand this one? You shake the reed about. Probably that stops them from growing or something. I guess that must be the idea. I don't know exactly how that works. I'm not an expert on reeds. And so don't know. But a similar kind of idea, I think. It stops them from growing, stops them from having any 
um, possibility of coming back to life again. Dukkha is finished once and for all there. When the stalk of a bunch of mangoes is cut, uh, all the mangoes attached to the stalk will follow along. Uh, in the same way, when the perception of impermanence is developed, etc., it eradicates the conceit, I am. Uh, yeah, so all those mangoes uh, or everything uh, that uh, comes after the cut, uh, yeah, all of that is destroyed. Uh, and those mangoes follow along. They are, uh, you know, those mangoes... Uh, I guess they don't really have any potential anymore for providing a seed for the future or whatever, and they are cut off. Everything is cut off down the track. Things stop growing. Things are eradicated as a consequence. I find the one with the root to be the most clear one, to be honest, but uh, these are, they're all kind of pointing in the same direction. Now, this one is quite powerful. The rafters of a bungalow all lean to the peak, slope to the peak, and meet at the peak. And so the peak is said to be the topmost of them all. In the same way, when the perception of impermanence is developed, it eradicates all conceit, I am. Yeah, so everything meets at the peak. Everything comes together there. The peak is the topmost. So uh, this means that all perceptions that you can develop all the things that you can do to train the mind in the right direction, uh, the most powerful one, the one that actually kind of brings all the other ones together, yeah, they meet together in this one, uh, is the perception of impermanence. Uh, that's kind of nice, right? It means that all the other perceptions that we do, that we're talking about before, uh, they kind of culminate in the idea of impermanence. That is what brings them all together. Uh, that's kind of a nice idea, not a nice way of thinking about it. Uh, and of course, that means that the... Uh, Perception of impermanence is really what we are trying ultimately to uh, bring out and to understand properly. Uh, and as I mentioned to you before, yeah, we're, meant, we're talking about the perceptions of death and old age and illness and all of these kind of things. Uh, and obviously, they're also about impermanence. They culminate, they come together in that peak. Yeah, they all have the same kind of uh, purpose ultimately to help us to let go, to abandon things. Uh, so powerful, powerful similes. Uh, Of all kinds of fragrant root, spikenard is said to be the best. <laughs> Me, one is just laughing. I, I know what you mean. I, I, I'm tempted to laugh as well. Huh? <laughs> In the same way, when the perception of, of impermanence is developed, it eradicates all conceit. I am. Do we have any spikenard experts in the room here? <laughs> What is that? Exactly. That's what I wonder as well. I think no one knows what it is. So it's kind of, you just laugh because it's said to be the best. And you say, yeah, really? Okay. I'll just take the word for it. <laughs> uh, so spikenard is just a root that is fragrant. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, the best kind of root uh, in the same way as impermanence is, to, is the best. Uh, but the next one is much more easy to understand, I think. Yeah. No, yeah, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> Of all kinds of fragrant heartwood, yeah, heartwood is sara. Red sandalwood is said to be the best. In the same way, when the perception of impermanence is developed, it eradicates all conceit. I am. Yeah, sandalwood, you, those of you who know about the incense of things, sandalwood has a very beautiful scent. Or just smelling sandalwood, yeah, you, I mean, you, uh, you probably have smelled that, uh, and uh, then you know what, what is meant by the fragrance of sandalwood. Uh. Now comes, the, now comes the one that is easier, I think. Yeah. Of all kinds of fragrant flower, jasmine is said to be the best. In the same way, when the perception of impermanence is developed, it eradicates all conceit, I am. Do you have jasmine flowers in Malaysia? Yes, you do? Okay, so you know what it's like. Yeah? You, you walk past a jasmine, it's like, wow, it really it smells very, very powerfully. Yeah. And so this is kind of the, the reason why. The only reason I know is because we have a jasmine flower in the monastery not because I'm a botanist or anything like that. We have a, in Bodhinyana, we have a jasmine flower. And I said, wow, that flower really smells beautiful and powerfully. And someone said, oh, yeah, that's a jasmine flower. That's how I know. Her. So uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have a clue. But uh, yeah, so the perception of impermanence has the best fragrance, uh, the most powerful perception, uh, just like the jasmine flower. Uh, I 
Agga. Agga is usually the word for best. Okay, all lesser kings are vassals of a wheel-turning monarch. So the wheel-turning monarch is said to be the foremost of them all. In the same way, when the perception of impermanence is developed, it eradicates all conceit I am. The wheel-turning monarch, this is like the universal, often called the universal monarch. And of course, all the smaller kings, the little rajas, in ancient India at the time of the Buddha, they had the idea of a Maha Raja, and then they had the ordinary Raja. And Maha means great in Pali language, and Raja means king. So the Maharaja were the king of the whole, the large countries in ancient India. Yeah, the great kings. And then you had the Rajas who were kind of the small, the small shot kings. Yeah, they were kind of, um, they were, uh, you know, belonged to a small area. Yeah, and so they kind of had a small area that were in charge of that. And so you had the, the, the big shots and the small shots. So that was, um, my father told me this story. It was, uh, I think that was in, uh, my father was in the shipping business. And uh, at one time they had all these dignitaries coming on board the ship to show them around. Uh, yeah? And they had a special room for the VIPs. And then they had the there was room for the less, not, not quite so VIPs. There was the VVIP and then just the VIPs in a different room. Yeah? And so there was this fellow who was, I don't know where he was from, but his English was really broken. He didn't know how to say these kind of things. Uh, so he said, big shots this way, small shots this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. If they... <laughs> I don't think that, would, that went down very well. I don't think anyone wants to be called a small shot. So that was kind of a bad, bad idea. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So here, the, here the, certainly the wheel turning monarch is the big shot. Yeah, let's be very clear about that. And the other kings, they are, they are the lesser kind of shots. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so the wheel turning monarch is one of these uh, mythological monarchs you find in the suttas. Uh, and uh, it's kind of very nice the way that they conquer the world. The way they conquer the world is that they uh, conquer by Dhamma. Yeah, they kind of come with their army. And they say, practice the five precepts. You say, yes, okay, yes, sir. We will practice the five precepts. And that's how it conquers this large realm. Yeah? Everyone's saying they will practice the Dhamma. It's a beautiful idea, isn't it? Uh, and it's a certain power of, uh, I guess, authority of, um, of virtue, authority of, you know, of, of that kind of power. Uh, and so you just come with the army and everyone says, yes, we will do, do what you say. This is the wheel turning monarch. Uh, kind of the ideal monarch, according to Buddhist ideas. And they would be very powerful, and then all the small kings, they would kind of fit in under that monarch. So again, it gives this idea of the perception of impermanence, being very, very powerful, being the overarching impermanence uh, in perception uh, uh, under which all the minor, lesser uh, perceptions, they fall in under that idea of the perception of impermanence. Okay, let's just take a short meditation break. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So this is the this is the nice thing about Google, right? Uh, Spike Nard. Yeah. So this is the, <laughs> there you are. These are images of Spike Nard, I think. Yeah. Can you see it? Spikes. <laughs> hmm. It's the root, right? I don't, there's no image of the root, though. It's supposed to be the root. So spike not root. Let's see what happens. Ah, spike not root. You recognize this root? No? <laughs> okay, enough, enough spike not. <laughs> All right, so please, let's have some, some questions. Um, yeah, please. Uh, well, yeah, yeah.
Well, um, they weren't. Uh, I, I, if uh, you can bring the box up because there may be too many questions to answer in the evening, so I can take a few extra if there's nothing else going on. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great. Please. Honorable sir, I've got two questions. The yeah. first one, yeah. um, when you mentioned karma raga, yeah. it's not just, it's everything in the five senses and then some of the things in the mind sense as well, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's yeah. just like karma where there's black and white and gray. In the mind, there's also that gradation of. Uh, uh, no, this is, this is karma, not karma raga, but yeah, karma, karma raga. Karma yeah. raga. So black, you know, what, black, white, and gray. What do you mean? That, that's that's kamma. Kamma, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah kamma. But yeah. as just yeah. like that, where they have black and white and gray in yeah. between, wholesome and unwholesome. Yeah. So in the mind sense, there's also like from sub, uh, vitaka and vichara down, and then the four Brahma viharas, and yeah. then there's all the generosity and the, all that has a bit of shades of gray. right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when you're yeah. mentioning ideas, that's ideas of the five senses. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So the mind is, uh, you know, yeah, so exactly. That's the whole point. Yeah, so the mind also has all of these things in it. Uh, so you need to purify it. And uh, indeed, there's, a, you know, the mind has all of these kind of shades of gray and uh, not all karma, not all sensuality, or, or not everything in the five sense world is necessarily bad. So we have to kind of choose the right kind of five sense world to kind of calm the mind, right? Uh, so you, uh, you no, know, we have to live in the forest of words. We have no choice, so we have to kind of choose the good things. So you come to you go hang out in the forest. That's where we go to forest parks. You kind of see the greenery, see the trees, or whatever. Or you come back home after a long day of work. You put on some soothing music, maybe some chanting or some nice music or something that soothes you down. Not kind of some kind of heavy metal or anything like that. It's something kind of nice. So we so we use the. Uh, we use the five sense world to our advantage. Yeah, coffee. <laughs> So you're quite right. Yeah. <laughs> the other one is um, avijja and aspimana, ignorance of delusion and the conceit I am. Hmm. Um, delusion is moha, the same as avijja, right? Moha and avijja. Um, they are very closely related, but not okay. exactly the same. And just like it, aspimana is like loba and dosa plus a bit of moha, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, aspimana like is, uh, yeah, well, yeah, Asmimana is, is it Loba and Dosa? Well, it leads to Loba and Dosa. I don't, I don't know if it is Loba and Dosa in its own right, because I think Asmimana is actually much it's more closely related directly to Avidja. I think it's almost like a different term for Avidja, in a sense, uh, in a deep way. I think Avidja is a bit broader, but Asmimana is like a, you know, one example of, of Avidja, actually. I think it's mostly related to that, uh, yeah. Um, but of course, it may, in the end, it will lead to Loba and, and, and Dosa, of course, because that's kind of what, what it does, yeah? Atta and Dhamma. Okay, so the, uh, so the, the Atta and Dhamma is like the Dhamma is what leads to the. So you have the Dhamma, which is the, uh, the, the, the cause, and the Atta is the effect, in a sense. Uh, atta and Dhamma, or the meaning. One is the kind of the, the teaching, the other one is the meaning. Atta and Dhamma. So... In a way, yeah, in, in, in a sense, we can put it that way, yeah. But, uh, yeah, cause and effect anyway. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. There's a sutta about uh, samatha and uh, vipassana. Mm. Why can you find that sutta? We, it's a way the, yeah. the monks argue about, you know, which is better between the uh, samatha and uh, vipassana and then the buddha said you know the people that come to me they have both samatha and uh, they use both samatha and uh, vipassana that's the sutta you mean the you know you mean the sutta what, what they are discussing yeah i, I know yeah there's what, the argument yeah be, the, between the two groups of uh, practitioners yeah. The monk that practice samatha and uh, another group practice vipassana and they argue mm -hmm. that there's a better. Yeah, I think the sutta you mean is one where one is a people who study the Dhamma, the other ones are the ones who practice the Dhamma. I think that's the one you're referring to. I think that's the only one I know about where they have an argument. Uh, and Gutra 4 is, I think, somewhere, maybe. Or yeah, and, and it's it. the Dhamma. And it's still true until today, right? 
<laughs> yeah, it is still true today. Yeah. And I've been listening, you know, the, yeah. the monks, the teacher yeah. that practice uh, Samatha, they say, well, Samatha is number one, should be, you know, practice. Yeah. And the Vipassana teacher yeah. uh, say, you should practice Vipassana is more important. So they still, you know, argue with yeah. you until today. I don't, I don't think it's the same argument. I think it's a different argument. But I, I think the main point is that, yes, there's always going to be arguments. <laughs> I think that's the main point. That there's always going to be arguments. You know, which one yeah. is, is better? Yeah. But the, the thing is that I th I, the biggest problem is not one or the other. The biggest problem is that we make the separation in the first place. Uh, because I don't think they should be separated. Uh, right. I don't, it I don't should think be both. But not, uh, the yeah. Samatha, you yeah, but, know, practitioner is there. Well, Samatha is too. Yeah, but it is, it is the same thing. You, can't, you <laughs> cannot say Samatha practitioner because Samatha practitioner is also Vipassana practitioner. And Vipassana practitioner is also Samatha practitioner. Uh, because they go, they go together. You cannot separate oh, them. Yeah. Uh. And, and then, once, you, once you see that, the argument is over. Yeah, that's kind of the nice thing about it. Yeah, yeah and the, ba yeah. the basic of both is to observe the mind, right? Yeah, the basic and thing is that uh, if you have vipassana, then samatha follows with it because they are, you know, there are two aspects, two qualities of the mind, and these two qualities always exist together. And that's the point. And so they, if you reduce the defilements of the mind, that's the critical thing. If you reduce the defilements, then that has two consequences. And the consequences are samatha and vipassana because the defilements are what makes the mind not peaceful. The defilements is what makes the mind not seeing clearly. So if you reduce the defilements, you have more vipassana and you also have more samatha. And that is why the Noble Eightfold Path is a path of purification. Yeah, You purify the mind and then samatha and vipassana are the result. And that's why I think the argument is of not really, not really worthwhile because uh, if you, you know, Anyone who practices samatha well will also have vipassana. Anyone who practices vipassana well will also have samatha. And so the, it's kind of a silly argument. Uh, and it doesn't actually, it's not really useful, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. to see the define, definements, we have to observe the mind to see the definements, right? Yeah. 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 So the basic yeah. for both is to observe yeah. the also, mind, it's sure. the, it's yeah. the mindfulness, mm -hmm. the right? Yeah, and using sati in a wise way. Yeah. 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 In, in all, in both. Yeah. Samatha and. Yeah. But, to, but sati has to become powerful, and sati is empowered through the meditation practice. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's why meditation is important. That's why samatha is important. That's why vipassana are important, because both of them lead to understanding and then to the uh, calming down. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Anything else anyone would like to uh, comment on? Uh, <clears throat> please, at the back. Yeah. Um, good morning, Ajahn. Good morning, yeah. Um, this morning, we have been, um, or since yesterday, right, we have been um, discussing on the similes on the conceit of I am. Yeah. And this morning, also, we um, see the benefits of it, but for lay practitioner like this, like 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 me, right? Yeah, I see the eye is more of this this person, this lung, this yeah. this this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. This me, I. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where I wish to um wish Arjun could clarify more on this uh, a bit more on the four great elements. Um, I'm not sure whether that is towards the Abhidhamma or is Buddhism. No, Sutta, Sutta, Sutta. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. then, because yeah. I, I, I can resonate a bit more when yeah. it comes to the four great elements to to face off this I thing, this me yeah. who is so huge and so real. Uh, yes, heard a lot about the benefits of it and the impermanence and the Anicca Anatta, but Mm. Frankly, if I say that I could, this is intellectual information, but how do I get closer to it? So I think the four great elements will be closer that the mind could resonate. So if I yeah. could. Yeah, okay. So, so um, the, uh, 
the uh, conceit I am is a very profound conceit. And uh, by doing the four element contemplation, you don't really get rid of the conceit I am. What you get rid of is attachment to the body. Uh, that is a small part of the conceit I am. Yeah? It's a very small part because you think the body is mine or I am the body. So you get rid of that part of the conceit. It's only a tiny fraction of that conceit. Uh, and so the main reason why you want to do the four element contemplation is to get rid of attachment to the body. Yeah? That's kind of the main reason. Uh, and that can be useful. Uh, and that is, in a sense, because you understand that the body is not wor really worthy of attachment. God, body comes, then it gets old. Anyway, it gets old. You know, who cares about this body, right? It falls apart, it gets sick, it dies. Yeah, who wants to hold on to this body? Uh, so first of all, you have to understand the uh, the problem with the body. Uh, the more you understand the problem with the body, uh, then you also want to give it up. And then part of that giving up process can be the four element contemplation. Uh, so what is, are you asking, what is the four element contemplation? How to do it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, uh, yeah. a bit more brief and understanding the four yeah. elements. And I, then because yeah. recently I read about this eight inseparable rupa. Inseparable rupas. Uh. Yeah. 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 Okay. You, these four great elements, another four yeah. um, other. Have, have you been going to Abhidhamma classes? Have you been? Have you... <laughs> I'm just asking. You don't have to yes, answer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so uh, four inseparable rupas. Maybe, but I, maybe that is the case. Maybe, I, I know, you know, the Abhidhamma has all kind of, uh, all kind of ideas in the Abhidhamma. But uh, if you stick to the sutta, as what the Buddha says, uh, uh, he talks about the four great elements, and they're very easy to relate to because elements are basically the, the earth element, which is the solidity. Yeah, anything which is solid, solid kind of in your body is the earth element. Uh, and then you have the water element. Yeah. Like, like coffee is the water element, and you kind of want to drink the coffee, it becomes part of you. That's why I look like, I should look more like coffee, because I drink so much coffee. <laughs> not, not look like coffee yet. Uh, and then you have the air element, which is the breath, yeah, and any kind of other air in the body. And then the heat element is the fact that you are warm. Yeah, you are warmer than your surroundings, uh, that's because the heat element isn't here. So it's very easy to see these elements in yourself. Uh, yeah? And you can even feel them. You close your eyes, you can kind of sometimes feel these elements in yourself. You can feel the hardness, you're sitting on the seat, uh, you can feel, uh, you know, you can feel the breath as the air element, uh, you can feel maybe the heat or the coldness in your body, that's kind of aspects of the heat element. Uh, and then you realize that in the end, all of these elements that are supposed to be you, uh, they are no different from the elements in the world around you. It's all the same. Yeah, You arise out of the world. You are built up, as it says in the Sutta, you're built up out of rice and porridge. <laughs> That's what it says in the Sutta. There's a bit of noodles on top, right? But basically, rice and porridge. This is what we are built up of. And it's kind of this, uh, it's kind of a, it's true. Yeah, this is what we are. I don't know how this body comes from, you know, in, in Norway, we also have a bit of bread as well. So, how, how does this arise out of bread and, and porridge? It's kind of extraordinary. That's what it is. And then when you die, it kind of goes back to those elements again. Yeah. And when, so when you kind of you eat, what happens? It goes back to the elements. It gets recycled. It goes into kind of the crops or whatever. And so when you kind of eat those crops, there's probably a bit of your grandmother's probably in those crops. Yeah. And you kind of take it in. And so we kind of get recycled. And we are, what are we at the end of the day? Yeah. This body is actually, that's all it is. And after a while, uh, you kind of wonder, why am I taking this body so seriously anyway? Uh, so this is the idea with this contemplation. And if, the more you do that, you are developing a perception of the body not really being a kind of separate entity. It's more like just belongs to nature, comes out of nature, goes back to nature, and you have no control over it. Uh, it's kind of here for a while and it's gone again. Uh, so this is the idea. And when you do that, you develop a sense of dispassion towards the body. Uh, the body is no longer... Uh, you know, you, you no longer so you don't hold on to it so much, and that can be very useful in meditation practice uh, because very often when the body starts to disappear, uh, that's when you get afraid, uh, yeah, and you think, oh, I better hold on to the body. What's going on? Where's the body? Uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, something like that. The uh, the sutta to read to understand more about the four elements is the. Uh, uh, the Maha Hati Padopama Sutta, the longer sutta on the elephant's footprint, uh, Majjhimalika 28. Uh, that is the best one, has a lot of uh, detailed instructions on the elements. Uh, there's also the Dhatu Vibhanga Sutta, uh, Majjhimalika 140. Uh, the analysis of the elements is also quite nice, but it's a bit more profound uh, and a bit more difficult to understand. Uh, those are two good places to start for, uh, for element meditation. Uh,